There we go. Look at this. Yes. Okay. Hi. It. It's Bye. been a while. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. So before we get started, let me just, I'm just going to show your face here on the screen. Um, thank you, by the way. So to the class, how this came about is, you know, yep. Sarah and I have been um, friends, colleagues, connected for over a decade for sure. Uh, I do, CES maybe, blog world, I don't remember, but we yeah. have a lot of the same uh, connections. And she just sent, it out, sent out a tweet like the other day. She's like, hey, you know, for any, any, any classes out there, would love to guest speak at, um, you know, any college. And it was perfect timing and we connected and, and here we are. So this is my San Jose State class. So everybody kind of wave hi. Cool. And this is Sarah Evans. And I, Sarah, so I did tell them a little bit about, about you, um, not a lot. So I do have some questions prepared. I did send them to you. Um, if you can just start by explaining who you are and what you do, and then we'll jump into the questions. Sure. So um, my name is Sarah Evans. I'm a digital PR correspondent and consultant, and I uh, started my company now 11 years ago, and I work in two very different and distinct ways. That's my husband different and distinct ways um, with brands. One is as um, an on-air or on social correspondent during key moments in time. I mean, we've got toilets flushing, I've got children, we're just- All good, like, all good, I have kids too, yeah. Everyone's home. Yeah. Um, so as an on-air correspondent, uh, where I serve as a subject matter expert, usually around digital lifestyle, technology, um, anything that has some sort of tech touch. So I get to help produce on the back end and um, create content that we can promote on social or even in mainstream media. Um, on the other side is as a full uh, digital PR consultant and unagency, and I can explain what that means. Um, so we do all of the things PR folks will do and sorry okay. that's okay no totally fine <laughs> i think i'm um, the only other one with kids so I, okay I, I this totally is just understand. totally blowing my mind usually guys you know i'm working during the day so this is um, of course yeah and thank you by the way for making time of course um so doing full-scale digital pr campaigns a lot of strategy so people hire me for my brain to come in and, and really think about how they launch, how they share, how they do something or celebrate a major moment in time. Um, and then I have an unagency style, which means then we can fully execute on that strategy. And I hire people and typically work with the same people over the past years um, and contract them out specifically for their skill set based on what the client needs. So, the, okay. so like, a like a creative person, design or writer, things like that? Yes, uh, somebody who's great at pitching TV, uh, someone who can be creative, but typically more on the um, media relations side. Awesome. So, okay, great. Thank you. Well, we have like a very diverse class here. Now they're all part of the journalism school and there are many who are, adver who are advertising majors. There are some who are PR majors and then there are also journalism majors. And one reason why I started teaching here at San Jose State 11 years ago was because I didn't feel like education system were, was preparing students for digital you know, and so that's what this class is. It's, it's really focused on, on digital marketing, paid media, social, and all that. We don't talk about media relations though. There, there's another class that, that talks about pitching media and the importance of relationships and things like that. So based on that, just based on your years of experience, what, what is one skill that is applicable in any kind of industry that you work in or any field that you work in that these students need to master as they enter the workforce? I'm sure you can attest to this, but writing, being a strong writer, you will always have a job. And there are different nuances with writing, learning how to write short form for social so that you can um, get engagement or clicks or whatnot versus ad copy versus a speech for um, an executive in an organization. Learning and mastering all forms of writing is something that will never be outdated. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the most powerful people in the world, all of them have speech writers. Some of the best books in the world based on professional accomplishments, ghost writers. So writers will always have a place, whether you're doing paid, earned, owned, shared. Um, in fact, I would look at that kind of marketing and PR matrix of all the different types of uh, content that we share and, and work on mastering each of those. Yeah, that's perfect. We we're actually talking about that. We were talking about LinkedIn before you joined. And the, you know, my class, we don't go through MLA format. I have no idea what MLA format is even, or APA style or any of that stuff. I know my colleagues in PR, but that is like the Bible, right? In terms of, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, 
you know, you mentioned digital PR, and I know that's that's a new term to them for sure, the class. And it's something that you've been doing for a long time and, and it's kind of just evolved since social media became a thing. How is that different from a traditional media relations and what are the parallels? I'm glad you asked that. And the key difference why I say digital PR is because it, then it doesn't pigeonhole me into just media relations. But anytime people meet PR folks, they're like, okay, great. You can get me in the New York Times. You can get me you know, in all of these print publications, traditional TV. And it is still extremely valuable. And I have various tactics, even utilizing local news and local TV for, for getting a big splash. But it means we're thinking full circle and, and encompassing the full um, content mix. So I said paid, earned, shared, owned. That's the peso model. And then I usually add in things like live or repurposed content. So we're looking at that full scope of how we can promote people. Are there YouTube in influencers? Are there amazing subreddits? Are there really prominent medium writers? Um, are there online forums and communities like Product Hunt or Hacker Noon, places where people live, work, and breathe, who will still be amazing vocal advocates or engagers for you, but don't only resonate on those you know, tier one media hits because a lot of companies that you work with, it's great if you can get placed in the New York Times or you can mm -hmm. um, get a, a CNN placement. But what happens after all that is done? How do you repurpose that? How do you share that? How do you get more media hits? Because there's, you're not always a, a front page news story. Right, right. Thank you. That's, that's a great answer. So kind of going back to your brand, your personal brand, you know, I, I follow you, we follow each other and I, I love your, your tweets. Um, and, and I don't honestly don't know how many of the students here have Twitter. This is our second class. Right. So we're still because getting to know we're old now. We're so. old. We are old. Twitter's my go-to, you know, and I know it's your, it's one of your go-to channels as well. And you're very helpful in like the content that you, you produce, right? You, I see you calling for, you know, speakers, commenters based on like your clients and things like that. You really, you provide a lot of good uh, material for people. You add value to the conversation. And it's not spam. And, you know, you do that on Twitter and you do a really good job at it. And you go to your Twitter profile, you will see the engagement. Um, what, Outside of Twitter, what what should these should these students even care about Twitter? And and I and I say that because part of the in in the syllabus I wrote, you know, the the requirement is is LinkedIn for sure. Yeah. Um, and Twitter is not a requirement, but in my from my perspective, it's it's a it's an opportunity. It's a great place where technology conversations are happening. Um, what's your recommendation to students who are not sure about Twitter? And, and uh, what's your point of view there? Depends what your ultimate goal is. For those of you who are journalism majors and PR majors, I would. 100% endorse that you participate in Twitter right now, if nothing else for the sheer monitoring of it. Um, if you are a, journal, a journalism major, it could be a place where you are with your first job um, enticed to go seek out sources or go vet information or connect with people. Uh, it's also really important in terms of amplification. What's really interesting in this day and age is when we are pitching stories to various news outlets they'll look at sources and say okay what's their what's their online reach because you know what they're looking at how can they repurpose and share and amplify a story to help with uh views and in interactions and engagement because at the end of the day that really matters to them and it matters to their advertisers and i'm not saying that that amplification trumps the actual newsworthiness of a story but um when you're going to pitch someone to be on uh, maybe more of a not news show, they're definitely looking at um, amplification. I'll tell you guys, last weekend I just recorded a segment for The Doctors. I don't know if you know that show, but I'm going to be contributing as their tech expert over this next season for season 13. And I can assure you that the producer did her due diligence on me. Does she have some reach? Does she have amplification? Is she an expert? So looking at those networks, Twitter's one of the go-to places right now for those folks. So even though I joke and I say I'm old, you're the next generation coming through, but people are still going to hold you to what's popular for certain segments of the population. So LinkedIn's going to be great. For networking and if you go into work for b2b business to business linkedin is going to be essential so i would definitely say linkedin and twitter and of course the most important thing when i was young and coming out of college i wanted to try everything so if you're active on on TikTok and snapchat and all those other places you might come up with really innovative use cases or examples that a brand hasn't thought of simply because they're so innate to you um, versus me. I go to my nine-year-old now and I'm like, what, what's cool? Like what, what's happening on Roblox? How do people talk? I, I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. So um, I have a 14 year old and I'm, I'm often a guest in her TikTok. So, and a few hey, on viral actually. So That's amazing. Um, how much time do you spend 
a day building your brand outside of, so I know it's, maybe it's hard to answer because I know for me having ADD, it's like, I'm, I'm tweeting, I'm, I'm creating content for me. I'm on client calls and I'm back and forth. So if you had to estimate how much time you spend a day building your brand. So I don't know if it's a time a day. What I will say is uh, about two years ago, I completely changed my workflow. So um, I don't do traditional marketing or advertising for myself or my company. Uh, but I always do say that social media is one of the number one sources of referral for business for me. What I did was completely change how I went about this. So for years, I was personal brand, building things up. I always wear big glasses. You know, I have a very specific look that I was utilizing. And then I flipped that. And one day it all just clicked and I thought, you know, I'm always building influence for myself. What if I could build influence for others? Um, after I had kids, I started thinking about what's my digital legacy? What do I want them to see when I'm not here? My grandkids and my great grandkids, because frankly, all this information will likely still be around and it completely changed what I wanted to share. So I thought I could become more influential by helping others become more influential, whether that's getting that place in the media, getting them the ability to speak places, getting them paid jobs, making sure I could be the voice at the table when I get asked to speak to bring two people who don't look like me to the table, people of, of color, LGBTQ, all of the letters, making sure that people are represented. Um, so I changed, I pivoted. Now every morning when I wake up, I take this self-reflection moment. And it's probably a lot of what you see on Twitter where I share what seems like maybe advice out to the public, but it's really my personal um, mandate for myself for the next 24 hours. It might be something I made a mistake on the night before, the day before, something I want to improve on this day. And I always start with that. And then I wait for my media sources to see if they're looking for sources. Uh, for upcoming segments. And then I do a bunch of research on my own and, and curate and share the best um, that I think the industry has. And then um, I'm doing client work the rest of the day. Yeah. Uh, class, I, I highly recommend if you do get on Twitter at PR Sarah Evans, I mean, she's, she, her content is great. Um, so it's not a requirement. It's not a homework assignment, but if you do do that. So let's talk a little bit about, about storytelling. You know, it's, it's a word that is often, it's, it's been used a lot recently. Data-driven storytelling is something that I kind of overuse as well. And can you just talk to me a little bit, what's your perspective on storytelling? And are there any good brands out there, either ones that you've worked with or have just seen who do a really good job at telling stories online? There are great brands telling stories. And I'm actually, I'm looking for this tool. I'm going to, um, I wonder if I can put this in the, chat. Yes. Let me see if I can add an attachment. Nope. I'll just send it to you. So okay. I have this resource I send to all of my clients and it's really from a PR perspective. But when we talk about story, I usually talk about newsworthy moments and I identify really four different stories and I won't get too strategic, but I do a lot of training on this. Um, one uh, you might have heard the term micro moments and it really is a marketing term, not a PR term. But I think about all of those individual or little touches that you have with people throughout the day. From a marketing perspective, it would be an app notification or, or something that happens on your phone. And on average, we get 120 of those per day. But there are, are PR or earned opportunities um, where things pop up for brands. They're not necessarily front page news stories, but they're opportunities to keep the conversation going. On Twitter, it just might be a somewhat viral tweet. You send out a thought, people start conversing around it. Now there's an opportunity for a brand to jump in or someone who's affiliated with that to be part of that conversation. But from a newsworthy perspective, we really want to break it down from a PR perspective. Here's how I break down story opportunities for clients. One is, is it the first, best, newest, latest, or greatest? This might be if you're the first to market for something and can verify that. It might be something disruptive and innovative uh, for a broken process. Something that has specific geographic um, story potential, like local, national, or international. The second is, can you offer data or statistics that help create a new story or support an existing one? Lo and behold, I found this year that infographics are still extremely popular. So we, we can package together information. They still resonate really well. You can get a, lot of, get a lot of backlinks and SEO traction, which is also really important. Um, typically, the folks where we place those stories are looking for um, truly vetted and verified surveys, some, something done by a credible third-party source or that contains more than 500 people. Typically, information that's non-self-serving, brands can insert themselves into that story, but really it should be um, a larger story. A third is, have you identified a new trend related to a major media moment or something unique for your industry? 
this one can be a little nuanced and people walk a fine line with this and journalists can see through it immediately. And so they'll bypass you if it's not truly a new trend. It usually is something no one else is talking about. For example, in the restaurant industry, we have a restaurant tech client. Um, when major moments have happened because of COVID-19, he will offer a very unique um, soundbite, something that actually is a call to action for the industry or will take prominent action and will hit all of the major TV show news producers on Monday morning with that soundbite and see who wants, who wants to book him for the week. So we'll use that. Um, fourth, is there a story featuring your customer or a member of your team that is emotional driven? driven? That's that human interest component. So something that offers a face and a voice for a bigger issue. And you all experience that every day. Think about the stories you stop and read the most, um, whether it's listening to someone doing an Instagram live about their personal moment, or if it's, you know, a magazine cover story. And then last, do you have an announcement that is impactful to your company industry, community, or the greater public. So this could be a public service announcement, a public health announcement, and also the release of a new product um, or the hiring of a well-known industry leader or expert, and my favorite large funding announcements by startups. Those are always fun. So that's long-winded, but those are all of the you know stories, newsworthy, some breakdown. Awesome. So who's doing a good job at it right now? Any, any well-known large brands uh, doing it well? So I have, I have lots of examples, but one of my favorites, I'm, I'm here in Las Vegas, so I always like to give some love to Zappos, which is a Las Vegas-based company. Um, one of the things that they did when COVID-19 first really, I don't want to say mainstream, but really everyone started working from home and, and it became something we were all talking about. They're already known for great customer service. Um, they talk about it. Tony Shea's written books about delivering happiness. It's something they live from the frontline associates to the leadership. In fact, their entire model is built around delivering happiness to their own employees first, and it translates to the customers. So we know their customer service is great. COVID-19 comes, and what do they do? They launch customer service for anything. You could call them with any question for anything. People were nervous, worried. They really took scope of that emotional compass of how people were feeling and created something based around that. I mean, I don't know of anything better than that, but that's such a great example. It's when you really live and breathe your brand, not only were they, they starting a new narrative and story, but they were inviting their customers in and anyone, even if you weren't a customer to participate with a, a, a touch with them. Oh, that's a great example. Yeah. I, Tony Shea's a great guy. Uh, he so, just stepped away. He just retired this past week. I, I missed that announcement. So influencer marketing, right? It's um, you know, it's one of those things. And, and, there's a lot of people in you, us being in social media for so long, we see like these experts coming in and out and being experts in different things. And a lot of, a lot of people just talk about it and very few have done it. And I'm curious, you know, what's your experience with influencer marketing and what's your, what's your thought? I mean, is, is it really impact that impactful for, for business, for brands? Um, it is in, in a few different ways. Number one, I'll disclaim, um, I just did some work with Lee Odin from Top Rank Marketing, and he launched a B2B influencer marketing report uh, last, well, two weeks ago. I would encourage you all, and, and you, know, you can always share a link to it with the class to take a look and check it out, because the difference between B2B and B2C is really very interesting. The B2C, which is business to consumer, those are likely the Instagram influencers you're um, watching and interacting with. And I mean, I go down the rabbit hole of makeup tutorials like you wouldn't believe. And I immediately I'm like screenshotting all of the products that they're using. And then I go on Sephora on some kind of shopping binge. I never document my haul, but I mean, that has a real time ROI um, for things that are very tactile, things that are consumer products. On the B2C influencer marketing side, that can resonate really well, whether it's brand placement, um, on a launch day. I and mean, you can see even the Kardashians, right? They have a new makeup launch or a skims launch by Kim and everyone's wearing it, right? All the most important um, influencers in their space because it obviously works. If they could do it on their own, they would, but they want the influencers. B2B is an entirely different animal and that's business to business. So think of um, SAP or Adobe products where it's usually enterprise driven or they're selling, to, they're selling their product to another business versus just a consumer. Um, the report that Lee and his team came up with said there's still a lot of room for growth. And you think this is not something new. It's been around for, for several years. And they still show that 
it's not necessarily that it's not working, but that they're the missing piece is that they always have to be on. It isn't like consumer marketing campaigns where you can do one-off moments in time because you have a product launch or something mm -hmm. you want to do. B2B takes a lot more time um, finding truly credible influencers with reach in that specific area and engaging with them for you know, six, nine, 12, 24 months at a time to start to see results because those are higher price point items. Those are things people will say, oh, Sarah was talking about this product. I don't need it right now, but maybe three months from now, I'm gonna buy it. And I remember I engaged with her mm -hmm. and that sounds like a great idea. So I'm gonna invest in that for my company. So two very different monsters. I, I will share the link as well with the class. Thank you. So um, last question and, and class, I encourage you to jot down some notes if you have any specific questions for Sarah. So in your career, what has been like one of your biggest challenges um, work related and how did you like, what did you do to overcome it? Uh, so I have pivoted my company a few times in the past 11 years. The original premise of what I built doesn't even exist anymore. And it was kind of a, a painful transition when that happened. When I first started, it wasn't just digital PR, it was digital social and PR. And at that time, social was so new, nobody had it in-house, nobody really had it figured out. So I got to be a leader in that space where brands were calling all of the time with just to pay for consulting to just talk about social media. And at some point in the first five years of my business, social went in-house. People were um, bringing in social media coordinators, social media directors, and, and parsing that under the marketing team or the communications team. So really what I was offering was outdated. Um, I wasn't doing, and I still don't do full social media management because community management is a, a whole nother um, expertise. So I had to, to change and go back to you know PR first and figure out what that meant. So I'd say that was the biggest challenge. The second one, was having kids. So having my, and I don't mean that negatively at all, but it completely changed where I was used to working these ungodly hours because you're a business owner and you're hungry and you want to do that. You have to pivot and change and, and learn kind of the ebb and flow of having a family and having a business. And it's something I still struggle with. It's not easy, but um, yeah. you eventually build new habits. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking your time. You, you, honestly, you know, shared some really good advice for the students. I learned a lot of things as well. So I'm going to open it up to anybody in class. Um, does anybody have questions? Just go off mute. And um, we'll just- ask anything. I'm still anything. sweaty from a workout. So nothing, nothing's gonna phase me. I have a question. Hi, uh, Julia. Hi, my name is Julia. Um, I'm just wondering about kind of like where you went to college and kind of just at the beginning of the stages of becoming successful, like what are the things that you really like dove into head on being a recent college grad and like how you got to where you are? Um, okay, so I'll try not to be too long. So I went to school at Millican University. It's a small liberal arts school in central Illinois. It's where I met my husband out in the, the soy capital of the world. And when I graduated, I was a um, communications and PR major. And during my entire time there, um, I was doing internships. I was really hungry to learn. I mean, I had, don't get me wrong, I had an awesome time in college and and, and, and had a lot of fun, but I worked really hard as well. Um, did lots of internships. And before I graduated, I made a list of the five places I wanted to work and I focused solely on that list. What I did was contact everyone at those organizations whose job I really admired or who I hoped to have one day and did an informational 15 minute phone interview. Um, most all of them were in Chicago, which was about four hours away, no, six hours away maybe from there. Um, so it wasn't really conducive for me to drive there. Now with social media, you can do the same thing on LinkedIn or Twitter, find all of these people whose jobs you wish you had at them, say, um, I'm a student, can I have a 15 minute informational interview Zoom with you and ask them everything about their job, get them talking about themselves, much like I'm doing right now. People will, will tell you more. You have no better time to do this than when you're a student. Most people have a soft spot for new grads or, or current students and want to see you succeed and will be more receptive to you reaching out. Uh, my first job was with the largest healthcare system in Illinois. I um, left there as the manager of communications and government relations and got amazing experience. I did PR agency work and then I was director of communications at a community college. 
uh, it was that was all before I was 30. So I, I mean, I, I did work really hard and, and then spun off and did my own thing. But I had some great corporate experience. And I will say, the reason I have my business is because I didn't love corporate. But the reason I have my business is because I worked in corporate. Um, it gave me the fundamentals that I needed to succeed. Much like any great athlete, we started with my husband, Michael Jordan, you know, dribble, pass, shoot. You have to get really good at those things and corporate will force you to learn them. And then you can take those with you anywhere you go. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Julia. It was a great question. Anybody else? Oh, hi. Me. Lisa. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lisa, and thank you so much for everything that you said. Um, earlier, you said something about being a fresh grad. You kind of dabbled a lot, like dabbled in a lot of everything, and you also told us to be good writers. Yeah. So do you re recommend us to also dabble a lot or focus on one particular niche? Because I, I want to be a copywriter, mm -hmm. so I don't know, should I focus just on the beauty industry, the tech industry? like or just do everything it depends what what your ultimate goal is if you have an extreme passion for one of those areas go ahead and go all in and focus and and go for it i always knew i loved um, nonprofit and technology so i try to find a way to bring both of those in at this point in my career i always say i wouldn't work with a beauty brand but if a beauty brand had some tech component to it then it, it might be a great fit for us they have a new consumer tech product or an app and focus there. But I, I think it's really important for the writing, no matter what, when you're dabbling in different areas, to focus on that core skill set. One of the things I would do is I'd find out, does someone need a press release? Because one of the catch 22 is like, when you go to get a job, they'll be like, okay, well, you need a year experience. Like, but I just graduated. So how do I get the year experience to get the job? Well, I spent that year before writing for anyone I could. Who needed something? Can I write your press release? Can I critique something? Can I edit it? Um, I found nonprofits in the area that had very little support. And I was like, can I please volunteer 10 hours a week to just do writing for you? And I just was hungry to get that experience because I didn't want to get left in the, oh, no, I don't have experience bucket. Oh, yeah. Thank Great you. Advice. Anybody else? Ooh, I must have done good if there's no more questions. Yeah, you did really good. I have uh, another question. Um, so just recently with like quarantine, so for a while, oops, sorry, I get text messages. That's okay. I, we all do. Feel you. Let me just try to. Um, so just recently with the quarantine, uh, I started to make like social media. I made like a Twitter for the first time and I haven't really been on social media in general. And yeah, it's been years since I've even had like a social media. So that's why I was wondering if that's kind of like a downside when it comes to having like professionals looking at me because there's not really much about me out there well, tell me what you want to do because if like you're going into the cia it's really not a problem um, what, <laughs> what what do you what are is your career um, so what i wanted to do originally i wanted to go into like any um advertising agency but i mostly wanted to get into like either it can go either way i can go into like maybe the fashion aspect of advertising or even like the medicine aspect of advertising. Cause I also had a bio associates degree before moving to SJSU. So here's what I'll say. If you are not comfortably comfortable being on social media, that is fine. My husband is absolutely not. He is a, um, a beer executive in Las Vegas. So he doesn't necessarily need social media. If you're not comfortable with social media is going to impact your role create accounts to simply watch and monitor, look for trends, look for nuances, monitor trending, trending topics. Mm -hmm. Because if you're coming into work in an area and then you get tasked with something related to social media and unfortunately, unfortunately or fortunately, there will be generational bias that they just assume you know social media because of your age. Mm -hmm. um, you still want to know how to actually execute those tactics. Part of what helped me speed rocket my career was just getting in and use, making all the mistakes on social media for myself so I wouldn't do it on brands, but also learning the really great parts of social media so I could repurpose those for brands. So you just need an innate knowledge whether or not you're sharing about yourself or not. 
Yeah, that's pretty much what I've been doing recently with like the creating a Twitter and stuff. I was just wondering, like, is it a big hit if I'm not really like putting myself out there and you know? Uh, I'd say and some brands might love it because you're less of a liability for them. So I think there's a positive to that as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that answers that question for me. Thanks. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Is that a guy? Okay, all right. <laughs> thanks, fellas. Um, so the question is basically kind of like your personal growth, like with your uh, business and all that. Um, so how was, you know, before quarantine and quarantine, um, like how's quarantine doing right now with you and your business? And where do you feel like we should uh, excel after quarantine in your point of view? My personal business, I will say there's nothing like a crisis to give a boost to a PR um, business. Everyone needed even more support during that time. So business had a huge spike for us. Um, on the flip side, I'm paying for an office I haven't been to for six months, but I get to go back to uh, next week. Um, and I also saw many of my peers who did PR in hospitality lose 90% to 100% of their business overnight. So the question someone asked just a bit earlier, was it Elisa? I, some, someone asked about um, you know, uh, getting into different areas. Well, somebody, obviously many professionals focus on hospitality who could have predict a global pandemic would shut down hotels and restaurants um, and they lost their businesses. I, I was not in that camp. Tech, technology is usually pretty solid. So, um, you know, that's interesting. I think coming out of this, one of the things that also benefited me well is that I've always had remote clients. I did travel a lot um, for in-person meetings, but I learned how to work remotely very effectively. And it's something that served me well. I think if you can learn great workflows and be a source of organization and reason, especially for companies who aren't used to working remote, it will help you from a few vantage points, one of which maybe you won't have to be in an office every day if you can show that you get your work done and that you're accountable and hardworking remotely. And two, you could you could help be a change, change agent in organizations that maybe are thinking about doing more remote work or um, eliminating offices. I think I don't wanna offer more advice in this area because I think this is where you all can teach us and, and say what you are learning and seeing or what you wish. I feel like now I've worked for so long, I'm, I'm so removed from what the next generation is looking for um, in their professional endeavors. So I can tell you how it impacted me and what I I think is important from skill set, but the rest I want you guys to tell me. Hey Sarah, if the, if the class wanted to connect with you on LinkedIn, could they? Absolutely. Okay. And of course, Twitter for sure. Oh yeah. Just put a note that it's from class and I will. Yeah. Absolutely. Connect. All right. Well, Sarah, I think that's it. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you doing this and um, I will post this on, on our channel soon, but um, yeah, the class will be in touch. And again, really appreciate your time and taking time away from your family uh, to spend mm -hmm. with us. So thank you. It is my pleasure. You guys have a great professor. Good luck to all of you. And I hope you're all safe and well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank All right. you. All right. Hey, guys. So what do you guys think? Was that good? Okay. Yes, it was. Highly, 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 highly recommend you, you, and get, you reach out to her and connect with her. Just say you're from San Jose State because um, she, like, what she said about helping others, it's true. I see it all the time. So um, you got to build your network, guys. Connect with each other, like I said last week. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to have speakers every week. In fact, I'm, I'm going to have a, a student, one of my previous students, I think she graduated four or five years ago, now works for Twitch. So I'm going to have her talk about how she's working with brands, um, how they're activating on Twitch. So that's pretty cool, right? Okay. So now any questions at all? Just again, we went through a very quick optimization study or a review of my profile. Are there any specific questions that you have about what I covered or anything that is specific to your profile that you wanted me to talk about? Um, I have a question. Okay. So um, I, I kind of wanted to ask her 